We were against raising VC money, and then we raised a multi-million dollar Series A. I'm going to tell you why on this episode. Hi, I'm Kyle Racky. In 2015, my co-founder and I turned down a $1.5 million term sheet for our business, Proposify. Now, you might think that we were a little bit crazy to do that, um, but Kevin and I came from running an agency before, and it was a little bit messy when we were trying to sell it. So we had been in the position before where we really didn't have any leverage and we didn't have a lot of control in our business. And we were always kind of worried about raising venture capital and raising you know, investment dollars and giving up some of that control. So that was a big reason why we turned it down. But in this episode, I'm going to talk about the story behind how we raised money and why we ended up raising money just recently and some takeaways for you if you're considering taking on venture capital or any other form of investment for your startup. So like I said, Kevin and I were traditionally against raising money because we had seen other startups and we'd heard all the horror stories of of startups that raised too much money too quickly, they grew too fast, and a lot of them ended up getting uh, acquired for less than they were worth, the VCs made all the money in the end, the the founders left with nothing. Um, or they got ousted from their company. So, you know, those those stories are pretty common in TechCrunch and, and any, any other uh, startup-related news that you hear about. And so it always kind of gave us uh, a bit of fear around the idea of raising money. Plus, we didn't really know what we would do differently if we had, you know, millions of dollars in in investment. We, we kind of already knew what we needed to do to, to grow the business, at least at that point. Um, and we didn't really know what the money would change. Now, things started to change after a few years when we were running Proposify. Um, two things really started to change was that one was we saw that the market was growing for what we were doing, and there was a lot of competition entering the market. Um, there was more proposal software coming out. There was more demand for it. And we thought that to stay on top of uh, our game, to to stay as leaders within that market where other competition was better funded and were growing uh, their teams faster, that we needed to keep up and we needed to stay innovative and and grow. So that was kind of one factor that we that we considered. The second one was we read an article that we found from the Basecamp founder. So that was uh, Jason Fried and David Hansen Heinmer. And they wrote an article about why they took investment dollars from Jeff Bezos a few years after they had come out. Jeff Bezos from Amazon invested in Basecamp and it wasn't because they needed to scale faster and, you know, grow insanely big. You know, Basecamp has traditionally been against the the VC model and a lot of Silicon Valley style uh, startups. You know, Basecamp is all about longevity and growing slowly. And, um, uh, you know, they're totally against that mentality. So you might think, why did they raise money from Jeff Bezos? Well, they 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 mentioned in this article that they did it because they wanted to have Jeff Bezos's uh, insight into their business and be able to basically p- pick up the phone and talk to Jeff Bezos. Well, the other one was that they were able to take secondary capital off the table. So what that means is instead of in a traditional round of funding where you create shares in the business and that's what the investors buy and they put that capital back into your business, the founders were actually able to sell some of their shares um, and be able to pull that money personally and almost have a, a mini acquisition Um so we read about this article, and it seemed to make a lot of sense. You know, if you're going to take secondary capital, that basically means that instead of waiting for some payday down the road that may never come, um, we can have a bit of personal cash now and, you know, really be willing to go the distance and not be worried about, you know, uh, paying for our kids' college or buying a house. So we really liked this idea, and this is why we decided to go out and see what the appetite was was like out there in the market for uh, investors who were, who were willing to do a deal like this. So the first thing we did was we reached out to warm contacts locally and otherwise that we had. Um, Kevin had a, a pretty good database of, of VCs and growth equity and private equity firms that had reached out to us in the past who we said we were not interested right now. Uh, he reached back out to those to try to find a good fit of somebody who was interested in a deal like this, who was, who was still interested in investing in us. And over the course of time, we spoke to a number of firms. 
Um, some of them turned us down. Some of them we turned down because they were just a little bit too uh, overly analytical. Didn't seem like there was a really good fit there. Um, but then one time, Kevin was down in Boston in uh, at the inbound conference. And by happens chance, he ran into uh, an investor who I'm going to call Donald. And Donald was very interested in in our business and in our uh in our industry's uh, proposal software, he was really looking for a company like us to invest in, and we were quite impressed with with uh, Donald. So he flew up actually only three days later from San Francisco to Halifax, Nova Scotia, where we live, which is you know a fairly far plane ride um, with only a few days' notice, and really impressed the heck out of us. We actually got a term sheet just later that week, which it's usually takes a long time to get a term sheet. So we were very impressed with Donald. Donald came, actually came from a really large VC firm out of San Francisco originally, which has invested in Facebook, Instagram, Apple, pretty much every company that you can think of. Um, he was there for 10 years and then started his own fund. So, so far, everything's great. We're thinking Donald's Donald's the one. Then we also heard that uh, a local businessman who is very successful, not in the realm of startups or tech, but actually in seafood, uh, John Risley was also interested in meeting with us who had been uh, taught, we had been talked up uh, by some people that we know, uh, mutual contacts. And we had a meeting with John. Um, He seemed interested. He actually has been investing in the local startup scene for a few years now. Um, and he expressed interest in getting his business partner, uh, who comes in on a lot of deals like this with him, Brendan Paddock, involved. Um, Kevin and I were kind of initially skeptical because we just didn't think that maybe these two guys didn't have a lot of uh, industry experience in what we do, software as a service and startups, um, and that Donald would probably be a better fit given his his experience in history. So... It ended up that Donald moved really quickly, got us a term sheet for exactly what we wanted, and we ended up telling John and Brendan, we're going to go with with Donald. It was a difficult decision because we really did like John and Brendan personally, but again, we thought that uh, it was smarter to go with, um, you know, the investor who's got the Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco experience. So we started going down the road with Donald, and I had actually called up a couple of his portfolio companies as references who mostly said good things, although one of them said that he, he would never do it again if he could do if he could start over. And that gave me a little pause um, because he said that Donald was really uh, overly analytical, um, really controlling. So that kind of freaked me out a little bit. We were just continuing to go down the road of due diligence with Donald, and I was beginning to see a little bit of that. Um, he wanted, you know, weekly phone calls and sometimes multiple times a week, a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of financial history. He wanted to do background checks on us. There was a lot, a lot of uh, due diligence behind this, which, you know, we kind of knew was par for the course. We had expected it. Um, but then things started to get really weird when we were a week away from closing. And Donald called us up and said, I have a problem. You guys lied to us. And it ended up that there was some things that came up in our background checks that were, you know, somewhat innocuous, um, but he had taken totally out of uh, context, um, didn't have the background info that we had, but essentially accused us of lying. So that was a that was a death blow to the relationship. And a, a few days later, we kind of said, all right, let's move on. Um, and go from there. Now, we still actually had a good relationship with John and Brendan. Um, They, thankfully, were still interested in doing the deal. So we came back to them and said, look, this is what happened. Are you guys still game? And uh, happily, they were. So although it put us back a few months, we picked things up again, and we uh, worked through now repitching to John Risley's investment company, CFFI. We had to get them on board and and um, kind of almost reassess the terms of the deal. But we ended up uh, doing it. Things went well. Um, it took a little longer than we had hoped, but by February, the deal closed and the money was in the bank. So what did we learn during the course of this fundraise? Now, one of the things that we learned was that the startup mantra of raise early, raise often, raise as often as you can – really just doesn't work for us. And I don't think it works for a lot of startups, even though that is what a lot of investors will tell you. 
um, raising is really hard. And, you know, even if you've got a good investors like we do, uh, you st- you know, it's still going to take months and months of the founder's time, and it's going to take their focus away from the business for at least a period of time. So raising money is not easy. And I've talked to founders, some of whom, you know, have deals in their pipeline that they're not putting all their effort on closing because they're also trying to raise a round of funding. And I always tell them, look, it's actually easier to close a deal with a new customer than it is to raise money from investors. Even if you get a yes, or even if you get a term sheet, it's still going to be months of due diligence and dealing with lawyers to, to happen. So raising is hard. It's very expensive. And you're also giving up valuable shares in your business. So I would make it um, something that you do very rarely and do it only when the timing is right. Um, the other thing that I learned was, you know, the the idea of taking money off the table and taking secondary capital isn't isn't as unpopular unpopular as you might think. You know, we kind of thought we would get a lot of pushback from all the VCs out there, um, but these kind of deals are actually becoming a lot more common, which which is nice to hear because if you're a founder and you've been slaving away and and you know taking a lot of risk for maybe decades, um, you want to be able to enjoy some of the fruits of your labors now. And to not be, uh, you know, in a in a bad financial spot forever. So being able to take money off the table is a great deal. Um, you're still going to own shares in the business. It's not going to make you uh, give up. It's not going to make you uh, complacent. You're still going to, at least in our case, we're still as passionate and, and ambitious as ever about this business. And, you know, the other thing that we learned, you know, in the months after raising the money, which might sound obvious, is that money doesn't magically make you grow. You know, a lot of investors will say it's rocket fuel. It's just money is is putting fuel in the rocket ship. But money actually takes time to spend. And the biggest thing that's going to help your company grow is building the people and the processes, hiring, but also being able to manage um, the right people as they enter into your company. And, and that just takes time. So just because there's money in the bank doesn't mean, you know, your growth is going to, the hockey stick is going to instantly start happening. It's going to take time to leverage that capital. The other thing that we learned dealing with other types of investors before we found John and Brendan was that we're just not the VC types. And, you know, I know a a founder who I call him the VC whisperer because he could raise $20 million off a napkin sketch. No problem. That isn't the case for us. We just don't speak the same language. We're not a growth at all costs uh, kind of company. We don't talk about making a dent in the universe. We don't talk about unicorns and all the things that VCs like to hear. We're just not that type. So we're really lucky that we found the right investors that aren't VCs and that we share the same uh, vision with. So how do you decide whether or not it's time to raise money for your company? Uh, there's a few factors to consider. One of them is that, you know, is your product already a leader in its in its space? Um you know, I'm not a fan of raising money unless we're talking very early seed rounds or maybe angel rounds of raising money too quickly. When you haven't yet figured out who you are or built up any kind of customer base or any kind of brand or revenue, it's better to raise money when you can accelerate and enhance what you're already doing as opposed to just creating something brand new from scratch. Um, is your market really big? Is it growing? You know, are you in a in a good space? Are you the the Netflix of your uh, of your industry and not the blockbuster, right? Is is what you're doing going to grow? One thing that I always liked that Jeff Bezos had said was that he doesn't look at what is going to change in 10 years. He looks at what isn't going to change. For example, with Amazon, in 10 years, nobody is ever going to want uh, their products delivered more slowly or more expensively. They're always going to want it cheaper and faster. That's not going to change in 10 years. And so that, you know, we kind of look at that um, in, a same, in the same way with Proposify is, People are always going to want a product that helps them make money, close deals faster, generate revenue for their business. So that's not going to go away. Um, and if you're in a in a similar kind of space with your company, you know you you would want to look at the same thing. Now, the other thing that you want to think about is how are you going to leverage this capital? Because the money doesn't do any good sitting in the bank. You don't want to have you don't want to raise money just to just to be safe and just to have a cushion. That's never what any investor wants to hear. They want to know exactly how you're going to take that money and use it to fuel the business and grow it and make it even more valuable. Um, Is your business sustainable without the capital, right? If you're raising it because you're in a tough spot and you're going to run out of money, 
that gives you absolutely no leverage in the deal. Um, and it means that you have to say yes and you have to accept whatever terms those investors give you. Um, so I'm a really big fan of raising when you don't need it. It doesn't mean that you can't use that capital in a smart way, but it means that if everything fell through and someone like Donald pulled out of the deal, um, you still got a great business, you still got customers, you still have revenue. So that is, you know, in a counterintuitive kind of way, it actually helps you close the deal by not needing it because there are occasions where our investors said, you know, maybe they pushed back on something or they doubted us and we kind of had the attitude of like, okay, don't invest then. We'll we'll close this somewhere else or, you know, get on the train before this closes. Um, we don't actually need you. That's actually kind of a way to help close the deal because it makes sure that you're not coming across as, as desperate. You just really want to, you know, if you take the investment – you want to make sure that you're you're going to do good by your investors and you're not going, going to waste the money. You're not going to sit on the money. You're going to put this money to work so that it can 10x or 20x or whatever it is, um, those shares for your investors who put that trust in you. So finally, how do you choose an investor when the time comes? You know, it sounds a little bit cliche to say, but I really believe that vision and values need to align closely. You know, for our investors, John and Brendan, we know that they care a lot about the Atlantic Canada community. We know that they want to uh, reinvest back into the local economy, create jobs here, build the startup ecosystem. And that's exactly what we want to do at Proposify. You know, we don't want to move our company to, to San Francisco and build a team there we believe that we can build a world-class company right here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So that's one example of how vision and values align for um, for the company and for the investors. You know, another thing is that you don't really want, just like if we had taken that money from Donald, we know that he would have been extremely controlling, just as he was during the raising process, he would have been just as controlling when it came to actually running the company and having board meetings. And, you know, you don't need somebody breathing down your neck when things aren't going well, right? You want to be accountable to your board. You want to be accountable to your investors. Um, but you don't want anyone necessarily holding your hands to the fire because it just makes a bad situation worse. Um, and finally, this idea of smart money, I think, is overrated. Um, the idea that you need to take investment dollars from somebody who's going to help you get acquired or give you great intros to other companies to partner with. You know, John and Brendan don't have a deep understanding and experience of software as a service, although they've built incredible businesses in other industries. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not smart money. You know, just that experience alone of the decades of building um, you know, an empire, it, it helps us, right? They, they can help us with, um, you know, ideas around hiring and around scaling and processes. Those are all extremely valuable things. It doesn't mean it's not smart money. So I hope hearing about our story of raising investment for Proposify has helped you if you're considering raising an investment yourself. And I want to thank you for joining me on the show today. This is Lifetime Value with Kyle Racky. This episode of Lifetime Value is brought to you by Proposify. Proposify improves sales productivity so your team spends less time creating proposals and more time selling. Start your free trial at Proposify.com. And be sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss a single episode. <laughs>